um, so many people in the United States own dogs as pets, but so I thought about, well, what are the other jobs in the world that dogs do? And I immediately thought of the Iditarod, which is a race in Alaska that takes place every year. So the Iditarod is about 1,100 to 1,200 miles, and it's through ice, snow, tundra, and it takes place every year in Alaska to the Bering Sea. It starts in Anchorage and ends in Nome. And that's about the equivalent of running from New York City to Miami. It's basically a celebration of the role that dogs play in shaping Alaska. For example, they would run mail and medicine and supplies all through Alaska because that was the only form of transportation that could be used. And one of the last great uh, accomplishments of the dog sled before the Iditarod was in 1925. There was an outbreak of, dip of diphtheria, which is a bacterial infection that causes like a, a mucous membrane to form in the throat. And the only way to get the serum was to have the dogs run on a sled for 674 miles. And they did it in 127 hours, and they saved everybody in the town. Okay. And the meaning of Iditarod in uh, the native, uh, or the language of the indigenous people that live in Alaska is distant or distant place, which is fitting. There are traditionally about three different types of sled dog breeds that are used to race the Iditarod because it's so cold. And they're typically Alaska, Alaskan Malamutes, Siberian Huskies, and Alaskan Huskies. Um, Alaskan Huskies, although, are not a traditional breed. They have been bred for speed, agility, endurance, specifically for this race in these conditions. And um, actually, there's a rule instated in the early 1990s because in the 80s, a man by the name of John Sutter entered the race with poodles. And <laughs> yeah. It did not go very well because they don't have the necessary undercoat to handle that kind of cold, and they also don't have the right uh, type of thermal regulation. And um, so when they got wet, rather than drying quickly and shaking off the snow or the water, it would mat their hair down and, and they would basically freeze. So Alaskan Malamutes were some of the first uh, sled dogs that were used in Alaska, even before the Iditarod. They're like the traditional sled dog. Um, they've got the really good thick undercoat, and so they can withstand all kinds of cold temperatures and, and wind. And they also have a really prolonged endurance, but they don't exactly have the best speed. So that's why they're not used as much anymore for the races. Siberian Huskies have also been used because they, they're really good team players. So they make good running dogs together because they like to work together. And they have a thick coat and love to exercise. And again, they also have really high endurance, but also they don't have adequate speed to win the race. And the Alaskan Husky is the modern sled dog of choice. It's, the, it's known as the ultimate racing machine. It's not a traditional breed. It, has, it just characterizes like a category of dogs that have been bred for the Iditarod races, which it's just like in super cold weather and they need to do it fast and not get tired. Sorry, I just want to think. They also have been bred with wolves and, oh yeah, short-haired pointers, um, Salukis, and Anatolian Shepherds are some of the other breeds that have gone into Alaskan Huskies. And their appearance varies a lot. Okay, so you'd think that in such cold climate of temperatures like negative 40 degrees, well, Fahrenheit and Celsius, um, that hypothermia would be the main concern, but it's not. Um, the common concern with the Iditarod sled dogs is hyperthermia because they're running so much and it's usually in the heat of the day when the sun is shining directly down on them and it's also bouncing radi radiative heat back onto them. And with their thick coat, it's very easy for them to get overheated and the typical dog temperature for a normal resting dog is about 102 to 103 degrees Fahrenheit. And with these dogs, how much they're running, because they're running about 100 miles every day, they can commonly get up to 107 degrees Fahrenheit. And if that happens and it persists over long periods of time, uh, then hypothermia can occur. Um, because of this, it's important for the mushers, who's like the people that are on the sleds, they typically carry uh, rectal thermometers and they're supposed to monitor the temperature of the, the internal temperature of the dogs every few hours. 
And if the dogs are uh, being subjected to hyperthermia, the mushers have to stop immediately and uh, brush the dogs off with snow or run cold water over them to cool them down. And they have to immediately put them onto the sled and not make them run anymore because it's important to get their dogs cooling down immediately. And they shouldn't be allowed to continue the race, but after a week they should be okay to, to go again. While hyperthermia is the main concern, hypothermia can occur. This usually happens um, if the temperature drops below negative 40 degrees and during the cold of the night when they're not running and not moving as much. And also the wind chill effect can also affect, can also predispose dogs to having hypothermia because the winds in the Iditarod can get up to 60 miles an hour. When treating hypothermia, it's kind of a similar procedure to when dogs have hyperthermia. You want to take them off of the sled immediately as soon as you notice the signs. And if they're shaking, like trying to shake, oh wait, oh sorry, sorry. That's okay. Okay. Um, so you want to take them off the sled and wrap them in a blanket. And if they have been, um, if they got wet, you want to cover them with a blanket and take off their jacket and their booties and because they have to have booties to protect their paws. If you, you want to take those off and replace them with dry ones and keep them either in your jacket or on the sled with you until you get to the next checkpoint. And at every checkpoint there's a vet and the vet has to clear the dogs as safe for continuing the race. Vitamin E is also important uh, with the Iditarod sled dogs because Oh, sorry. It can prevent oxidative muscle damage, and with the high fat diet that sled dogs eat, um, a, lot of the, a lot of the times the vitamin E it becomes deficient. And if that does happen, um, anemia can result because of the destruction of the red blood cells, and so it's often uh, recommended that the sled dogs during the race get a vitamin E supplement. And while normal dogs typically get 20 international units per kilogram of diet, it's recommended that uh, sled dogs get 400 international units just because they go through so much of their vitamin E to prevent their muscles from degrading over the course of the race. This is a musher by the, musher by the name of Mitch Seavey. Uh, he won the race in 2017 and he completed the race in eight days, three hours and 40 minutes and it was just over 1100 miles. So what really sets apart sled dogs from uh, domestic, like other regular domestic dogs that are resting is their unusually high metabolism. They eat up to 12,000 calories per day to accommodate for the rate at which they're burning calories. That's, in, yeah, it's like burning, or it's like consuming 24 Big Macs every day and humans can really eat over 5,000 calories in a day. They burn, do, uh, sled dogs will burn about 240 calories per pound of weight per day, whereas humans, and this is not just average humans, this is like athletes <coughs> like running the Tour de France, they'll only burn about 100 calories per pound of weight per day. Um, and this is because, oh sorry, um, they're, oh yeah, it's because of their diet. They eat a high fat diet because they're able to easily convert the fat and bring it into um, the mitochondria to be used as energy. Whereas typically in like normal resting dogs and humans, we have to take carbohydrates and proteins and convert them into usable energy. But dogs bypass all of that. They pull fat directly from the bloodstream and use it for energy. So they're able to maintain that high calorie burning and um, endurance level. So yeah, um, because of that ability to pull blood, um, fat in directly from the blood, they basically are fatigue proof. Because of their high fat diet, they have an endless supply, or, or practically an endless supply of fat in their diet, and they just continue to pull it in as the race continues. But in humans, this does not happen, and in regular dogs, it doesn't happen either. And there's been a lot of research into this, but they're not exactly sure how the dogs do it, but they're able to flip sort of a metabolic switch. And by a couple days into the race, their uh, glycogen stores be begin to replenish, which normally they would just be um, 
degraded and used up over time, which is what causes fatigue in humans and regular dogs, is the use of glycogen and then the buildup of lactic acid. But once this metabolic flip, uh, switch is flipped, they're able to pull in the fat directly from the bloodstream and, um, oh, sorry, I just lost my train. Okay, that's okay. So they're able to pull the fat directly in from the bloodstream without getting fatigued. I do have a question though. Yeah. I mean, when they're not racing other parts of the year, they don't get that's that. That's what I was going to say. Sorry. They don't get that big fat diet, do they? No. no. Oh, sorry. No, they don't get the high fat diet uh, for the rest of the year. Um, but what happens about a couple days into the race, their metabolic rate goes back to a baseline seen in resting dogs. Mm -hmm. So, whereas their metabolism should, of glycogen should increase, it goes back to a resting dog. And they're not sure how this is accomplished yet, but dogs are, but it, they may have been able um, to be trained to do this over, his, over the history of breeding and uh, the intense environmental conditions. It might, they might have learned how to do it out of necessity. Oh, and uh, the re one of the reasons why they think it might be easier for uh, dogs to pull, or sled dogs to pull fat from the bloodstream is they have a higher mitochondrial density than uh, humans and regular dogs. They have about 70% more mitochondria per cell, so they're able to bring in more energy and thus burn more energy at a faster rate. And they also think insulin might have a role to play in this metabolic switch. And if they can figure out how dogs are doing it, there might be implications for helping or curing uh, diabetes and obesity in humans. Do these uh, sled dogs also have a much higher um, oxygen or aerobic capacity. And aerobic capacity allows, um, it's how much, it's the volume of, of oxygen per body, per body weight um, that the animals are bringing in uh, and transporting through their bloodstream. And the aerobic capacity for a human athlete, so not even just like a, a regular human, but a human athlete, is 60 to 80 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram per minute. An untrained sled dog is already well above that at 175 milliliters per kilogram per minute. And then uh, a trained sled dog during the race can acquire oxygen and circulate it through its body at 300 milliliters per kilogram per minute. So they're quickly and efficiently moving oxygen through their body, through their bloodstream and into their muscles, so that also helps prevent their muscles from fatiguing and degrading. And as I said previously, this might, uh, the metabolic propensity of dogs to be able to switch their metabolism rate might have implications in humans, um, especially in the military, because uh, with soldiers enduring very strenuous activities for prolonged periods of time, if they can figure out how to switch their metabolism to prevent their muscles from fatiguing, it can really improve um, their overall health and immunity because as muscle fatigue and body fatigue occurs, their immune system goes down. And this is Larry. He is kind of a legend. Actually, no, he is a legend. Yeah. He is nine years old and he's now retired. He retired in 2009 after he won the third consecutive Iditarod with the same uh, musher. So they've been together his whole life. He, in his lifetime, he's run over 12,000 miles, and that's not include, that's just racing. That's not including all the training and other exercise he, that he did growing up. He finished a total of eight Iditarod races and four Yukon quests, which is a similar dog sled race. Uh, he's, he's a good lead dog, so he keeps the line stretched out with the sled dogs, and he has led teams in 10 of his races of 1,000 miles or more, and he won seven out of those 10 races. And then in 2007, which is just like right before he retired, he won both the Iditarod and the Yukon Quest. And the final race he ever ran was just over 1,100 miles. Okay, excellent. That's uh, a whole lot of stuff there. Yeah.